Hello beautiful people, welcome back to the channel. My name is Chu and today we're going to be going over the three basic steps I take to mixing most of my trap beats. Shout out to the comment winners, comment below to be featured in the next video. A few quick announcements, I'm giving away a copy of Ozone 8 with the video. All you have to do for a chance to win is comment what your favorite mixing tip from the video was. Or if you knew them all, what's your favorite mixing technique? Just comment something about mixing. I'll announce the winner's next video. I have five free kits and five free beats available to any and all producers and artists. All you have to do is click the link in the description. Wristband bundles are now free and they come with more stuff. They come with the two wristbands and two kits they came with before, but now they come with a button and a sticker as well. And a VST giveaway raffle ticket. And a collaboration raffle ticket. Hella good stuff. Get a wristband bundle. Lastly, my boy Danny Iko just dropped his debut project, Hard to Love. He had some crazy producers and features on there, and he himself is extremely talented. I was very happy to be a part of this. I produced the intro, Love Camp, which you can hear playing right now. Let me know if you recognize the loop. <laughs> All right, now onto the tutorial. Drop a like if you learned something new, or just end up enjoying the video. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell to join a family of dope ass producers who enjoy really good content. So here's my basic three-step approach to mixing. Leveling, equalization, stereo imaging. Okay, so first we need a beat. We can't level shit without a beat. So let's just grab some piano. Oh, let me show you guys like my go-to minor harmonic chord progression. This is what I always use when I'm in a bind in the studio. So let me pull out the minor harmonic scale from the centerfold drum kit scales folder and let me make the key like B minor. Yeah, that's pretty good. Now I'll lay down a six chord, a five chord, and then a one chord to finish. Then I'll flush it out with some other stuff. Hmm, actually, it's still not really doing it for me. Let's see. Oh, wait, I can use a MIDI from the new Candy Keys Volume 2 MIDI Melody Pack that I just made with Larry O. It's got 20 MIDI melodies, 10 from me, 10 from him, and they're super dope. They're inspired by Travis Scott, Q Beats, Logic, and the sorts. And they're made for you to be able to plug and play in any VST and instantly go with a dope ass melody. So we'll grab one of those and keep going. Way better. If you guys would like to check out the pack, it's free to download and the link is in the description below. All right, now some drums. Okay, okay, some hi-hats. Oh, and the 808, cannot forget the 808. Maybe fill out the melodic space with a pad. Yes, yes, perfect. And a flute, <laughs> because why the fuck not? Okay, great. Now we can route our sounds and instruments to the mixer and get started. I usually begin my leveling with the 808 or sub bass. These along with the kick, clap, and snare all end up being the loudest things in my mix. And all of these peak around the same place, negative 16 decibels. So to start, I'll level off my 808 right at negative 16 dB. Then I'll bring in the melody. All my melodies get leveled between the range of negative 34 dB and negative 27 dB. This is a large range that takes into consideration the fact that different types of melodies can have varying levels of perceived loudness at the same decibel peak. Negative 34 dB is almost always good enough for me, but I like knowing that I can push that limit if need be to get some extra loudness without having to worry about hurting the overall quality of my mix too much. One more thing of note that I do while mixing, I usually let lower octave melodies peak higher and louder, and I generally have my higher octave melodies peak lower and more quiet. I do this because I've noticed that sounds that are in higher octave ranges seem louder and more harsh because of the way our ears and brain perceive sounds in this frequency. This can be mitigated with EQ, but I found that proper leveling is just as effective if not more. So based on the range I just specified, I'll do some leveling for my melodies. From here, I'll move on to my hi-hats. 
Now these, I have a bit of a tier system for deciding which peak I want to use. It's going to sound really weird, but just bear with me. If I want a soft felt rather than heard sonic appearance for my hi-hats, I tend to have them peak at about negative 27 or negative 28 dB. near my melodies. If I want the hi-hats to be present, but not overbearing, I will have them peak at about negative 24 dB. And if I want my hi-hats to be a dominating presence in the beat, I will have them peak at about negative 20 or negative 21 dB. Think Tay Keith for this vibe. I'm sure he actually goes much louder with his hi-hats. Those of you who are familiar with his production may be able to attest to that. And you can always push it higher if you want, and lower. Everything here is just a reference point. There are starting markers that you can use to create your own unique mixes and styles. My kick and snare will both be leveled at negative 16-ish dB. As I stated earlier, I like to have these close to the same level as my 808 or sub bass as they are the loudest things in my mix. And then all my perk sounds are leveled between the range of negative 27 dB and negative 18 dB. This is a large range that allows me to comfortably account for the sonic variance and amplitude across various percussive sounds. This section won't be extensive simply because I don't think that that would be very helpful for you. If you want a full tutorial on equalization, I'll have some sources for you to check out in the description below. This section will be more of a look into my basic approach to mixing, that is, things that I do every single time I mix a beat. These are tips that I highly recommend if you aren't doing them already, as they will instantly cure your beat of most of the muddiness that I've heard some of you complain about. So the first thing that I EQ is my melodies, and this is simple. I EQ out all the frequencies under 200 hertz and over 12,000 hertz. Frankly, these are frequencies that are never needed in your mix from your melody. These frequencies can often clash with your other sounds such as the 808, and you definitely don't want that, Chief. You don't want anything fucking with that 808. Speaking of which, the next thing I'll EQ is the 808. Again, this is pretty simple. I always cut the frequencies below 30 hertz on all sub basses and 808s. I do this to clean the low end muddiness from my sub and thus my entire mix. Though the exact number where you should make the cut varies depending on what producer you're talking to, most will agree that this is a very necessary cut in your mix. And you can even notice that this now has the 808 hitting louder and clearer. Please note that as you equalize, things will get louder and quieter. Be sure to double check your levels after you add effects and adjust them accordingly. I don't do a crazy amount of traditional stereo imaging. That is, I don't really just pop out the ozone for every project and go to town on the mix. While that's probably got its own benefits and rewards, I simply don't have the time for that. But I do want to run you through three ways I normally manage the stereo image of my mixes to give them more perceived width and depth. They are reverb and delay, stereo separation by musical octave, and panning. So with reverb and delay, this is pretty simple. I toss them both on most if not all of my melodies and I always use the same general settings. Before I start, it's important to note that I slot all of my effects under the EQ because I want to be sure that any VST modulators I add won't create more low end or high end frequencies that I will need to equalize out again. This isn't really a professional skill, at least I don't think so. It's just something that makes sense to me. So first I add the reverb. This is what gives melodies their airiness, allowing them to take up more space in the overall mix without having to be louder by amplitude. You can use anything for this, but I'll use Fruity Reverb 2 because it's stocked to FL and it's heavily slept on. From here, I'll select a preset that I like. They're all pretty good, but I often find myself choosing between the large hall setting and the cathedral setting. Now that I've selected my preset, I can edit it a bit. Normally, the only change that I make to these presets is turning the bass knob all the way down so that the VST adds a minimal amount of reverb to the bass frequencies. I pretty much only use reverb VSTs that have built-in EQs like this because the control is just unmatched. Plus, I really, really hate reverb on my low end, and you should too. Next, I add some delay to give the melody even more width. 
I actually don't know the difference between reverb and delay, honestly. I know they both repeat input signals to create echoes in the output and that delay somehow does this slightly different than reverb, but that's about all I got. So if you're a mixing guru, please comment below with clarification. I would be absolutely grateful. I'll use the Fruity Delay 2 here. Again, another stock FL plugin. Stock FL is GOAT status, baby. I'll switch over to the widen preset because duh, we want more width. And again, pay attention to where I'm slotting this delay between the reverb and EQ. This plugin stack is essentially what I use for every melody with just a few variations here and there depending on the sound of the VST. And you can do the same thing with any plugins in any DAW. I'll silently show you this process once more, this time using some commonly known paid VSTs. The next thing I'll do is stereo separation by octave. Let me explain. This isn't a real musical concept, so it might sound insane. Here's how it makes sense in my mind. The higher you go with the melody, the better it sounds with width, especially if it's blending with other melodies and harmonies. This knob on your mixer controls stereo width. Moving it to the right will make your sound mono, meaning it will be perceived as having one signal coming from the dead center of your mix, two-dimensionally. Turning this knob to the left will make your sounds more stereo, meaning it will be perceived as having many audio channels that are spread around your mix, three-dimensionally. So for this particular beat, I'll leave my main melody as is. I'm pretty happy with its stereo presence. I'll spread the width of my pad some, and then I'll spread the width of my counter melody a bit more than that. Lastly, panning. Again, this is about creating a sound image for your listeners. You are essentially an orchestra conductor when you produce. You have to tell everyone what to play and when to play it. And you have to make sure that all the instrumentalists are situated in such a way that the audience has the best listening experience possible. This is what you're doing with panning. You are telling the musicians where to sit. You can really do this however you want. There are no rules. Like. <laughs> For real, just be creative. The one thing that I would say is that I don't recommend panning anything hard left or hard right. I would like to add to that by saying that most drums and traps stay centered, though percussive panning is an excellent technique to use. I'll show you all how I would apply panning to this beat. And there you go, that's how I mix, <laughs> every single time. And the more I practice these, the better I got and the quicker I was able to do the chains. And it's gotten to a point where I do it so unconsciously that I'd rather make the chain each time than drag in the preset from one of my banks. That's how much of a second nature a lot of this stuff can become if you practice. Thank you so much for watching. I'm gonna let the beat rock for the outro. I'll also leave a link to the FLP for anyone who wants it. Drop a like if you learned something new. Share this video with a producer who could use some help with mixing trap beats. And don't forget to subscribe. If you don't, your FL Studio will freeze the next time you use it. You'll spill coffee on your MIDI keyboard and your crush will call your next beat trash. I mean, probably not, but why chance it? Peace. Hey, so I want to start doing these like outro sections, I guess, where I'll probably just put up like a community post about what the video topic is going to be. And I'll ask you guys questions and then I'll just come like kind of cover those questions. Um, This is from the community post that I put up about a week ago asking you guys what you wanted to see covered on the mixing process. OK, so this first question is from Nave Beats. Navi beats. I'm not actually sure how to say that. Um, and they asked how to master a track for general streaming loudness. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this. You can just kind of use any mastering um, plugin on your master track. So you could use something like Ozone or any of the Wave plugins, or you could even use something that's stocked to FL Studio, like 
um, Maximus um, and just use some of the presets there and those will work the Maximus presets are gonna be pretty buns but some of the ones for the ones for ozones and wave ozone and waves is gonna be way better um, and then you can also learn to do it on your own there's a technique that I use with the um, fruity limiter and the soft clipper that's pretty cool actually and at, um, at the EQ and it's pretty neat I can it would be difficult to explain right now but I could maybe go in depth in another video if you guys would like to see that so let me know or i could maybe do like a mini clip on instagram or something where i talk about like how to master your beats like really really quick and really easy for loudness next question is from audi um and they ask just how to make the beat sound good on all platforms that's that is 100 in the mix definitely there's some very subtle things like there's there's some very subtle things um that you can do to make your mix sound better on a streaming service like and there's very specific settings like people know very specific settings for like streaming platforms but if your mix is bad it's gonna sound bad no matter where it is so you want to more so focus on just mixing well first before you start thinking about okay how is it gonna sound on youtube how is it gonna sound on soundcloud how is it gonna sound on itunes you know that's that's more of an, an afterthought especially if you don't have the general like mixing concept down but if you do then my advice would be to look into some high-end um mixing applications and plugins because those are going to be what gives you that crisp quality for streaming you're just not going to be able to get it out of stock stuff the way you're going to be able to get it out of you know a high-end mixing and mastering plugin um, and then even I would recommend maybe using something like Studio One or um, Pro Tools for mastering your stems if you want that really, really high quality sound in your uh, in your mix downs. This next question is from Ocelot. They ask, do you use Ozone 9 to master? Could you go into detail the steps and process towards mastering? Referring back to the question previously asking about how to get loudness, I would love to cover that if it seems like you guys are interested. So I would absolutely. And to then answer your former question, I do actually use Ozone 9 now. I just got it recently. I loved Ozone 8, was a fanboy, had a tough time trying to move on. But once I got it, I was, I love it. And I got the whole package. It's, it's good stuff. It's a good investment. Ozone really changed my perspective on um, making beats. It, it really taught me that mixing is can be difference making once you understand it. So I think it's a worthwhile investment for any producer who, who maybe has some money left over from Christmas and is looking to make an investment. All right, let's maybe do like one or two more. <laughs> Epi, I really appreciate you for doing these. Thank you. Oh, man. Thank you. Pompous Panda, please do more mixer presets. Uh, maybe in a while. <laughs> Ones are still doing good. Category four. You can mix only with sound goodizers. <laughs> Someone's smoking crack. Okay, let's do Dynamite 1998. They ask how to EQ drums properly, or they say that how to EQ drums properly would be nice. I didn't talk specifically in the tutorial about EQing drums, but I'll say this. You, in trap at least, it's not that big a deal. It's just not that big a deal. Like, if you if you are overthinking beats to the degree that you think that EQing drums is going to be the difference making thing, then I would say or if, if that's how you're breaking it down in your mind, I would say you're overthinking it too much. Just buy some good sounds or steal some good sounds like just get some good sounds. It literally let's just fuck the ethics about it for a second and just let's just say get some good sounds however you have to do it and use those so that you don't have to do any extra mixing. The high, that's the point of getting good sounds. It takes it takes away all that processing that you have to do so that leveling becomes your your, your main priority and you can move from there. Um, but if you wanna know some just like regular things that I do to EQ my drums sometimes after that little soapbox that I went on, um, sometimes I like to cut the high end out of hi-hats and I cut the low end, I cut the low end out of a lot of stuff actually, like hi-hats in general, I'll just like EQ a bunch of uh, low end out and some of the high end, same thing for like snares sometimes. I don't take the low end out of snares too much. I actually might use a bit of like additive EQ to, to like beef it up a little bit or I might use something else like a compressor just for my to get my snares to hit really hard or my claps I really like when my claps and snares are thick and chunky um and yeah maybe I'll put reverb on hi-hats here and there just you know a bunch of different things but I'll say with trap drums just the straight clean sounds is usually your best go-to there's really no EQ you need there's really no extra effects you need as long as your sounds are good um thank you so much for watching this video thank you so much for listening to my what's got to be 20 minutes of end notes at this point <laughs>
just thank you i love you guys so much you guys make <laughs> my dreams possible like literally i don't know where i would be without you guys i love you so much stay happy stay healthy always be creating just make sure it's dope content only peace